first of all, I want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today in this um, October monthly webinar session. Um, please know that this webinar holds every fourth Tuesday of every month, and it's been very, very um, informative. Thank you so much for joining us. Before I introduce the, um, the guest speaker for this um, webinar series, um, please, I've got a few announcements. We're going to be taking question and answers, and that's going to be in the chat box. So please, if you have any question for Dr. Kelly, just write them in the chat box. I will be able to attend to that towards the end of this session. And also, um, we're going to be having the presentation um, after the end of this webinar. It's going to be available. Just send us an email, and then we'll be able to send that to you if you need one. Um, I'll also be um, talking about the next webinar session after this series. But before that, let me please um, introduce our guest speaker to you today. Uh, we're going to be having, uh, we have today Dr. Kelly Froelich. You know, she's an assistant professor, extension specialist, small ruminant production with the Department of Animal Science, South Dakota State University. And um, she, you know, we got a bow, and that's very, very interesting. I'd love to share a few things she sent to us. Um, she, um, she's a native of Minnesota, and she grew up on a commercial hydroponic lettuce and tomato fan. Um, she said she corrupted her parents, you know, and then they were corrupted to get only a few sheep when she was about 13 years old. And she's been involved in the industry ever since. And I mean, we have someone to listen to being involved in the um, sheep and goat for about 13 years. She and her family has a flock of 150 Lincoln Longwood use. Um, Dr. Kelly owes two BS degrees in animal science and agricultural education from University of Minnesota. She has an MS in dairy science from South Dakota State University, and of course, a PhD in animal science from Lincoln University in New Zealand. So she's going to be speaking today on forage and pasture management for sheep and goat. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us, and please can proceed with your presentation. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction. That was great. Um, so just as a like foreclosure for everybody who's um, watching, so I am not a, I would say, forage or pasture range management um, specialist. You know, this is just kind of what I've learned from my colleagues who are range specialists and, you know, being involved in the sheep and goat um, side of things. So kind of get started. I kind of always like to point out that sheep and goats are not the same, same, right? So as a small ruminant extension specialist, we always kind of get sheep and goats shoved into the same, you know, like they're basically the same animals and they're really not, right? So I have this nice little graph um, from American Sheep Industry uh, Sheep Production Handbook. It does a pretty good job depicting, you know, the difference between sheep, goats, and cattle, right? So between those three species, they all have kind of their preference on, you know, what they like to eat. So you can see on sheep, they're kind of in the middle, split between forbs, cows, and grass, right? Um, goats tend to like a little bit more of the browse and the forb side of things. So, and I also put it on there if you're not quite, um, can kind of figure out what those different circles are representing. Um, so the sheep, you know, they had a choice, right? 60% um, is what they like with grass, 30% forbs and 10% browse. And this can vary a little bit depending on where the animal is and stuff, but this is kind of like the average, right? If they had a choice, what they would kind of go for. Puts are a little bit different, right? So they mainly prefer, you know, mostly browse, right? Um, so this is just kind of good to know, you know, as we're talking about forage and pasture management, that different species, you know, like different things, right? So I also put in the slide here, just talking a little bit about grazing behavior, because they have those differences in kind of what they would select for, you know, it's also kind of important to keep that in mind. So when we talk about goat grazing behavior, they'll tend to select grass more over um, clover, where sheep will you know, kind of select the opposite, right? So clover would kind of fall into that forb category, um, if that's, you know, 
uh, if you re refer back to the previous slide. Um, but then also I mentioned that, you know, goats will browse over graze. And here's one that kind of always, you know, surprises people. You know, if you're going to look at goats versus sheep, goats are actually more selective, right? And, you know, everybody's probably heard the joke that goats eat everything, including tin cans. Well, that's not quite mm. true, right? So when we talk about cows, you know, you know, we see them eating a lot of things that we would like visually, we're like, oh, there's no way that that has good nutrition or whatever. Like, for example, um, this is a picture from a project that I was helping with, uh, yes, last summer and the summer before we were using goats to browse eastern red cedar trees, which are native or invasive to the Great Plains area, right? And the goats would sit there and rip all the bark off the trees, right? Visually looking at it, we're like, why the heck would they eat that? Like, there's no way that that's pretty, you know, very nutritionist. But, you know, they're more selective in that, you know, it probably actually has more nutrition than what we're visually thinking it does, right? So goats are really good at, you know, selecting and eating parts of plants that visually we look at and like, you know, there's no way that has great nutrition, right? But in reality actually does have great nutrition. They just have a little bit more ability to um, deal with like plant defenses um, than what sheep does. So the both of them, you know, obviously, you know, green over dead or dying, um, you know, both will select for quality forage, you know, or plant material, you know, so quality um, plant material before they would select, you know, something that was poor in quality. Um, both, you know, top down grazers. So if you ever watch sheep or goats, you know, eat on grass, they always kind of start from the top and they work their way down. That's different than compared to like, let's say cattle who just take their tongue and they just kind of rip everything up, right? So that's kind of, you know, also important to know, you know, and if you ever looked into like um, diverse species grazing, you know, between like cattle and sheep or cattle and goats or something, they can complement each other really well just because of their grazing behavior. And then also too, um, so they're gonna prefer eating clean, forage, you know, over contaminated, right? So there's some pretty good uh, studies done, you know, uh, especially on the sheep side of things, you know, if you have, um, you know, a pack of manure or whatever, they kind of eat around it, which you can't blame them, right? You probably wouldn't want to eat next to your feces either. So. so when we talked about, you know, factors affecting dry matter intake on pastures, there's a couple, you know, different things that I like to kind of break it down. So the first one is forage quality. So this can be your stage of maturity as, you know, one way to think of it. Um, forage density or length. So this is your quantity. Um, and then lastly, the environment or availability. And this can be a bunch of different factors such as different plant species, you know, your weather, how much you're stocking them, um, that sort of thing. So all three of these things are pretty closely um, interrelated. And you'll see that as I kind of progress through my presentation. Um, but all of this is going to affect, you know, their dry matter intake on pasture, right? So, you know, this is kind of, you know, important to kind of keep in note um, as I move through and I'll, you know, talk about each of these, you know, more in depth as we go on. Before I like, before I'm going to do that, um, I just wanted to kind of do a quick lesson on basic um, nutrition and simply just talking about the difference between dry, dry matter and as fed. Right. So this oftentimes gets people kind of mixed up and confused. Um, so if you're ever formulating a ration or you have your nutritionist formulate a ration, um, they'll often, you know, there's two different things. There's dry matter and there's as fed. And it's pretty important to kind of know the difference. So you can kind of think of it this way. Feed contains two different fractions. They have water and then they have dry matter. Right. Simply put. So there's a couple of different terms that, you know, use quite a bit. So as fed is what you would feed on the farm, right? That's going to contain the water. Um, and then you have the dry matter, which is all the water removed. And sometimes also, too, you'll hear the word 
um, air dry. And basically, like if you're on a farm and let's say um, you're trying to, you know, calculate out a ration or whatever, you don't have an oven to dry plant material in, you can leave it out and let it air dry, right? Um, this isn't going to remove all of the water, but will remove most of it. So, you know, we can figure that plant sample, you know, once it gets dried, it's going to be in about 90% dry matter. So if you ever look at like a feed report, you know, like for hay or something, they're usually always will be close to kind of that 90% dry matter. The reason why this is kind of important to know, you know, the difference between as-fed and dry matters is that nutrient nutrients in a feed is contained in the dry matter, right? So when I say this, there's a little bit of a caveat. So you can consider water as a nutrient, right? It's a very important nutrient. Um, when it comes to feed, you know, we're just going to say, you know, hopefully they're getting that nutrient from the water fountain and not the feed, right? So if we were to visually look at this um, on an as-fed basis, so let's say you have, you know, feed here, right? You're going to have your dry matter and you're going to have your water. So the green dots are dry matter, the uh, blue dots are water. So when we look at an as-fed basis, um, if you're looking at uh, a sample of feed, right? That sample of feed, if it's in as-fed, should be heavier than one that has been dried down, right? And that's simply because you have that water, you know, present, right? So if we say a feed is 60% dry matter, what that means is that 40% of it is water, right? If we put it in the oven, we dry it down, you know, that comes lighter because you're removing the, the water, you know, and that means um, it's gonna be 100% dry matter sample, right? So this is important when we're going, um, oh, sorry, I forgot I had that box. So when you're converting between the two, always divide or multiply by, you know, the dry matter. So decimal form, right? That's pretty important um, to know. So like if you're finding percent dry matter, um, you have 12 dots that are, you know, dry matter. 20, if you count the water, 60% dry matter, right? Once you remove the water, going to be 100 percent. So this is important to know when you're talking about, you know, specific nutrients. So let's say um, energy, crude protein. Um, so what this kind of looks like, we have our dry matter, red dots will be now crude protein, right? So if we have, are looking at um, formulating a ration and we're making a ration based off of an as-fed basis, it's not going to be super accurate depending, you know, on the day, the type of feed you're feeding, just simply because the water can have so much variability. So when we formulate um, rations, we always look on a dry matter basis, and this removes all the water, also removes, you know, all that variability. So um, when we have, you know, remove the water, you know, because the water is absent, you know, those nutrient con concentrations will be condensed, right? If we had water, you know, those nutrients are going to be diluted because the water's in there, right? Um, and because, you know, the percentage of water in feeds can vary so much, it can add a lot of variability. And so when a nutritionist is formulating a ration, it's always good practice to do it on a dry matter basis and then convert it back to an as-fed basis um, for what you feed on the farm. So, okay, and back a little bit to our pasture um, in the factors that affect dry matter intake. So if you remember from my previous slide, the first point I had on there was forage quality, right? So this is pretty important um, when we talk about dry matter intake on pasture. As intake of pasture is related to the rate of breakdown in the rumen, right? So, which is also related to the quality. So I have this nice little uh, picture here from the National Range and Pasture Handbook. So this is basically on the y-axis we have, on the left side, we have dry matter in tons per acre. On the right, we have digestibility percentage, and it also further to the right has the intake percent of body weight. On the x-axis, we have the growth stage of grass, right? So when 
we have grass first starting like in the spring of the year, right? So the grass is going to be nice and leafy. Dry matter, um, tons per acre is going to be low. But that digestibility is going to be high, right? So for our animals, that means um, the nutrients available to that animal is going to be greater. It also means that this animal is going to eat more simply because usually when we're in this kind of leafy stage, there is more water present, right? So as the grass matures, so let's say we get to the point where it's flowering or heading out, um, our di digestibility is going to decrease a lot. Right? And this is simply due to as, you know, those plants mature, there's a lot of um, components in that grass that just, you know, adds, um, makes it more fibrous, right? Um, so that means that our digestibility is going to go down. It also means that as a, um, um, sorry, that's my train of thought, like our uh, dry matter tons per acre is going to increase, right? So like if you're looking at here, you know, um, our dry matter is going to be a lot higher. Our digestibility is going to be down, right? Um, so that's kind of important to note that there is kind of a sweet spot, you know, if we're looking at high forage um, grasses, you know, and it depends a little bit on our, you know, uh, stage of production for our livestock, right? If we're trying to grow lambs or kids on pasture and we want them to have good quality growth, we're going to want to have them the grasses that are going to have high digestibility um, that are going to be more um, nutritionist. So lower quality feeds um, restrict the amount of feed capable of being consumed in a 24 hour. So if we're feeding them all the like mature stuff, digestibility is going down, right? That means it also slows the passage in the rumen, right? So they physically just can't eat enough. So if we were to just kind of visualize a uh, pasture quality, and I apologize for the kind of weird spelling. I borrowed this from a friend in New Zealand. Um, this was from a research project. But on the top here, we have a, you know, poor quality pasture. On the bottom is a higher quality pasture, right? Um, so on the top, the first thing that you notice, there's a lot of dead matter in here, right? So it has a lot more mature forage. So in New Zealand, they like to use um, metabolized energy, which we don't use in the United States. So it kind of just did calculations um, for you. So this total uh, TDN, which is what we use for energy, total digestible nutrients, is about 49% on a dry matter basis. This bottom pitcher, which is a mixture of grass, and you can see some clover in there. It's a lot greener, you know, it's less mature. Know, has a higher um, TDN percentage, which is 69%, right? So it's important, you know, to kind of know that, you know, if you're walking through your pasture, you see a lot of dead stuff, you can automatically kind of assume that it's going to be has, you know, that less energy in there, which, you know, might be perfectly fine if you have, you know, dry uh, does or dry um, ewes on there. Um, you know, that might be perfectly fine for them. But if you have are trying to grow a lamb or kid and get any sort of growth on them, you know, you might want something that is a little bit more high quality so you can get that growth from them. So the second point that I kind of had was forage density length. Um, so your quantity of forage, right? So I kind of talked about, you know, in one of the, you know, first slides that our quantity affects how much that animal can eat, right? And that's also dependent on quality. Remember, I said they're pretty closely um, related, but your quantity, you know, also affects, you know, amount that they can eat. So their bite amount, how much they can eat, so their rate or intake per bite. So if you're looking at this picture on the bottom, you know, animals in this pasture on the right, you can see that has been, you know, graze quite severely. You can see dirt and everything else are going to have to spend a lot more time raising it, get what they need, right? I mean, you're probably looking at this pasture and says it doesn't have much, right? So your animals are going to be suffering in this pasture. If they go on the left, you can see a lot more forage growth. Those animals will be able to eat um, more and get, you know, the dry matter intake that they need. So it's important that, you know, from 
an animal perspective that you're providing pastures that, you know, are going to be able to meet their dry matter intake, right? Both sheep and goats and, well, humans, any livestock, you know, we all have a time budget, right? So we only have 24 hours in a day, right? Um, so sheep and goats, they spend six to nine hours up to 12 hours a day, you know, grazing in five to six grazing pets. If they're on a pasture such as, you know, this one in the bottom picture, you know, they're going to have to spend their whole day trying to graze just to get enough to eat. Realistically, they're probably not going to get enough to eat. So if you have, you know, a nice lush pasture, you know, that has the density and the length um, and they can, you know, graze and get their fill within a, a few hours, you know, they'll be doing pretty well in their time budget. You're having a pastor that looks like it's grazed down to nothing. They're going to have to spend their whole day, you know, grazing and probably not get what they need. So this is just kind of, um, you know, putting this in a little bit of a graph form. And I apologize again; it's in you know kilograms because um, it's borrowed it from a friend in New Zealand. Um, but you don't need to know that, right? It's the same, you know, if you were looking at pounds of dry matter. So if you have, this is just looking at intake and quantity of pasture. So on the axis, you have pasture mass, right? Your pasture mass is low. Your pasture intake or your, you know, pounds of dry matter is going to be low. You increase that pasture mass, you know, that can, that will increase your pasture intake, right? Um, so as pasture mass Clients, you know, harvest is going to be harder for those animals, which means that they're going to spend more energy walking around trying to get the fill um, than if you had a pastor that provides them, you know, that has, has the quantity, right? Um, your quality of herbage um, declines too. And this kind of goes a little bit more onto the plant side of things. Um, and I'll maybe brush on this a little bit, but typically if you have a pastor that is overgrazed, the things that end up growing there are the things that your sheep or goats, well, maybe they don't really want to eat, right? Or thistles or something like that. Um, and as your pasture mass declines, you know, you're going to have decreased energy intake, you know, have less to meet maintenance and production. And certainly if they're like a growing kid or a lamb, they're not going to be, you know, getting enough to meet their demands for growth. So this is again just looking at um, kind of pasture cover and quality. So I stole this from um, Beef and Lamb New Zealand. They have a pretty good extensive um, application that you can find online um, that's just talking about like pasture quality, like principles and management. And this is some of the work they've done, right? So on the left hand side, so this is just looking at they have do two different you know, uh, types of quality pasture. So the blue line is for a uh, sheep. So this is about a 70% um, TDN pasture, which is pretty good. And then the kind of teal line or light blue line, you know, is 61% TDN. So on the bottom, they have herbage um, mass. So, and I kind of did my own calculations and converted it to um, pounds of dry matter an acre. And then they have, um, Keep live weight on the left uh, side here, right? So if you have, uh, you know, a pretty high quality uh, pasture, um, you know, your sheep are going to gain more live weight um, than one that is, you know, less energy, right? So on the right is also looking at, you know, kind of lamb growth, kind of the same concept as this uh, left-hand grass, um, but the bottom we have or on the x-axis, Access, you know, diet quality. So, and again, I've converted it to percent PDN, and then lamb growth rate um, in grams per day, right? So, the higher quality the pasture, you know, the better that animal is going to grow, right? So, if you know one of your goals is to raise your kids or lambs, you know, um, and kind of pasture raise them, um, and being able to market that way, you know, looking at the quality and quantity of your pasture is going to be pretty, pretty important. So, just to kind of summarize, you know, forage quality and quantity kind of up. Um, so, our rate of ease 
rate of eating or ease of harvesting is the therefore our cost of eating, right? So our poor quality forages um, will take that animal longer to chew because it's more mature and swallow. You know, it's going to decrease, you know, our rumen um, kind of uh, by past uh, what's it's going to decrease, you know, um, our ability for our rumen to turn over that forage. Um, so if it's easier to harvest, you know, those animals will increase their bites per minute, which will increase, you know, their dry matter intake and more likely be able to meet their um, nutritional requirements. So pastures that have quality and quantity mean sheep and goats will use less energy to consume a given amount of energy, right? So the last point um, that I kind of had um, was just talking about environment and availability, right? So environmental factors can also affect their dry matter intake on pasture. So these are things like plant species, right? There's some pretty good research out there, you know, from New Zealand, Australia that use a lot of, you know, pasture-based systems um, that they will spend more time, you know, grazing ryegrass than if you have like a you know, mixed pastures that had some clover, right? And that's simply due to the fact that if you think about it, rye grass has, you know, pretty narrow leaves, you know, and they sit there and they chew off each and every week leaves. Whereas, you know, clover, you know, they have bigger leaves, it's more nutrient dense, they can kind of just grab a bigger mouthful at one time. Um, other environmental factors, you know, certainly weather can be a huge factor. Um, this year in South Dakota, I mean, in Western South Dakota, we were, they were pretty blessed with rain. Um, but, you know, in the years previous, we've been quite droughty, right? So obviously, if we're in a drought, you know, grass isn't growing, right? Um, other factors, you know, stock density, um, rate. Um, certainly, if you have a lot of animals on there, they're going to consume that pasture pretty quickly, um, depending on the area. Um, if you're less dense, right, those animals might not be able to keep up with the amount of forage being produced. And then I also threw in here um, topography. Um, so, I mean, Missouri's pretty flat, um, so you maybe not have to worry about this as much, but it, certainly if you're like in... Um, hilly or mountainous areas, you know, the amount of grass and forage availability can change depending on what aspect of a slope it's on, right? So I also included, you know, some other pictures here just talking about, you know, grass growth rate, right? So um, as we're like, let's say we're just starting a new pasture, we seeded a bunch of um, new plants, you know, our grass growth is going to be pretty slow. Right, it increases um, as that you know uh, grass has a chance to build up root reserves. Right, and I also put this in here because just to talk about overgrazing a little bit. Right, so this bottom picture, oops, you know, kind of um, talks you know a little bit on how we use the plants. Right, so there's some mindsets that you know if there's a little bit of grass out there, they're like, oh, that animal has plenty. Right. But in reality, if we want to do a good job with our pastures, we need to be aware of how much they're eating and how far we're taking down those um, plants. Because in order for a plant to grow roots, which helps them, you know, grow more, um, they need to have leaf surface. Right. So if you're using most of the plant and you're eating it down to basically the ground, you're gonna affect that root mass, right? And that plant is not gonna be able to get, you know, all the nutrients it needs to put on more, you know, green part above ground, which is what we want the plant to eat, right? So that's pretty important to, you know, just kind of keep in mind that, you know, we need to leave some of the green leafy part, you know, when we move our animals, right? We don't need to graze it all the way down to the ground. So this next slide, um, I just, you know, it's in here um, kind of, you know, talking about, you know, different environmental factors, 
Um, another like important aspect is just knowing what you have for uh, plant species, yeah. right? So depending on, and I'm not super familiar, you know, with the kind of, you know, plants and grass, you know, Missouri kind of grows out in their pastures. And this is going to depend so much on where you are in the U.S., right? Um, but we have different types of grasses that can be considered warm or cool season, uh, meaning that, you know, when they grow the most um, is going to be dependent on, you know, the timing of year and the environment. So in this part of the world, like we have kind of mixtures. So our cool season grasses, you know, um, they're going to be growing earlier in the year when it's cooler, right? So this, these two graphs are just looking at the difference of grass growth, right? So warm season, um, are the ones that are going to be coming in, you know, later in the year. So like June, July. Um, so they might have, you know, a couple little um, different, you know, peaks of when, you know, most growth occurs. But it's pretty important, like if you're developing a pasture-based system and you're wanting to manage your forage um, well, that you kind of know what you have and what your grass, you know, curves look like. And I would suggest that if you're interested in kind of finding out in, um, what types of grasses and stuff, that you reach out to your local extension people or even NRCS, because they can help you a lot with this. And, you know, over time, you know, hopefully you can kind of keep records of your farm and develop, you know, and kind of know when your grass uh, growth curves are. So when we think about, you know, just grazing pressure, it's good to think of it, you know, as a system thinking approach, right? So we have to think about, you know, if we're more managing our pastures and forage that we have to think about the plant, you know, what I was kind of talking about, we don't want to take it all the way down to the ground, right? Because then we're going to affect the roots. Um, we need to think about the animal. So, um, you know, how much is available for them? You know, are they going to meet their um, nutrient requirements. Um, if they're a growing, you know, kid or lamb and you have mature pastures, is that going to be enough to sustain their maintenance plus growth, right? We also have to think of it from the environment too, right? So just not overgrazing. Um, you know, there's, I didn't talk about it previously, but there are co consequences, you know, to things like overgrazing where you can cause um, erosion, you know, that sort of thing affect, you know, the types of, you know, plant species and stuff in your pasture. So this is another nice little graph that I got from the National Range and Pasture Handbook. But, you know, it's important to kind of keep all of these factors in mind and find that optimal range of, you know, managing your pastures. So on the y-axis, we have, you know, your uh, production. So forage production on the bottom, your grazing Pressure. So kind of like what I say, said before, you know, if you have high production um, and your grazing pressure is low, basically, you know, you're not use, utilizing your pasture very well. If your grazing pressure is very high, your, you know, production is low, now you're overgrazing, right? So there is an optimal range, you know, in between. Then also on here, if you notice, like have kind of output, and output per acre. So if you're overgrazing, you're kind of shooting yourself in your foot, and your output per acre, your output per head, you know, is going to decrease. Oops. And then I borrowed this um, slide from one of my other previous uh, talks. So in my PhD, I did quite a bit with um, parasites. And it's also, you know, I put this in here because parasites is a huge problem in both sheep and goats, right? And if you're not convinced that you shouldn't overgraze your pastures, maybe this will help, right? So the majority of our parasites live, um, that larvae live within the first couple inches of grass, right? So if you're not grazing below a certain level, you know, you potentially can minimize your parasite pressure. If you're overgrazing and your animals are nibbling um, the grass down within the you know first two inches, chances of them picking up the larvae and stuff on that pasture is a lot greater. So I just wanted to put this in here um, because it is also, you know, an important factor um, that, you know, I think we should, you know, kind of consider when we're managing our um, sheep and goats on pasture. 
So when we're estimating um, forage mass, so talking about all this, and I'm talking about how, you know, if we want to meet requirements, you know, help with the environment, that we need to kind of estimate, um, you know, know how much, you know, pasture you have. So there's a couple different ways to estimate forage math or mass. Um, so a couple, you know, common methods that are used um, in this in the U.S. is, you know, clip and weigh method. So basically, this is where you have like a hoop or a square that's a certain area, right? You throw it out in the pasture, you clip it down, you weigh that mass, you know, you do it in a couple areas to get kind of um, and then calculate out what your forage production is on a per acre basis, right? The other method is a grazing stick. Um, so both your NRCS office, um, at least in this part of the world, like if you're like, hey, I want to know what my forage production is in my pasture, you can go and talk to them and they will actually have information on how to make a hoop um, to like uh, measure, you know, your forage production or um, in our NRCS office, they actually have grazing sticks that they can give out. And basically the grazing stick, it's a yardstick and they've done some like average calculations. So you put it in the grass, you take multiple measurements um, throughout the pasture and it'll give you kind of an estimated um, dry matter, like a uh, forage quantity for your pasture. So um, for the last few slides, you know, I just have um, kind of an example of calculating your forage demand. Um, so when we're calculating forage demand, um, the first thing that we're going to do is calculate our total forage production. So um, my example is that, you know, we used a grazing stick method um, and determined that you had 2,000 pounds of forage per acre in your pasture and you have about five acres for grazing. Right. So if we want to calculate our total forage production, we're going to take that 2000 pounds of forage per acre, you know, times our five five acres to get a total amount, which is 10,000 pounds of total forage production. So our next step is just calculating, you know, how much of the forage that we're going to give for that livestock. So we talked a little bit about overgrazing and how we don't want to do that. Right. So you may have heard um, kind of the saying like take half, leave half. Right. Um, so this method is or this kind of saying has kind of come out about like if you're managing your pasture as well, that you take half of, you know, what has grown and leave the other half, you know, for that plant to kind of um, rejuvenate itself. Right. And that depends on, I guess, how tall your forage is, if it's already kind of short you know, you're not going to want to take it down half um, because you might be affecting those root reserves. So this is just kind of a diagram depicting that. Um, so if we take half, you know, of a stand of plants, right, we can figure that about 25% of it is going to be ingested by the animal and 25% of that is going to be wasted. So this is just, you know, um, animals trampling it or, you know, um, they pooped in that area, they're not eating around it, that sort of thing. So if we're calculating our forage um, allocated for consumption, we're going to take that 10,000 pounds of total forage that we calculated in step one, and we're going to times it by 0.25%. So this is known as our grazing efficiency, right? So um, it's just, you know, and you can change this grazing efficiency, you know, kind of this is, again, where records and just kind of knowing what your farm does and what your animals eat is pretty important, right? But we're just going to use a standard 25%. So this allows for 50% of the grass to be eaten, we're figuring 25% will be waste, right? That means if we take that 25%, that we're going to have 2,500 pounds allocated for consumption on those five acres, Right? Going from there, then we can kind of calculate our forage demand, right? So this is where we need to know, you know, our animals and also our pastors, um, because as we kind of talked about before, if you have a high quality um, pasture, you're going to increase digestibility. Um, and also because there might be more water weight, you're going to increase your consumption. Right. So on a dry matter intake as like a percentage body weight of your sheep or goat is going to be increased. Right. 
Do you have a lower quality pasture? Your digestibility is going to decrease um, and is also going to decrease your consumption, right? Typically, those pastures are going to have less water. It's not going to go through the rumen as fast, you know, so we can figure that their dry matter body um, percent dry matter on their body weight is going to be less, right? So when you're trying to figure this out for your farm, um, the easiest is to kind of uh, use, you know, standard book values. And then as you develop your records, you can fine tune that, right? So assume, um, just getting back to our calculation, assume that we have like 50, 150 pound uh, dry use, right? So they're basically just needing a maintenance diet. So we're going to take a look at our um, uh, table here, which is from the NRC for small ruminants. So this is just, you know, saying how much dry matter, you know, a goat or sheep will need, you know, to meet their dry matter intake, right? So you can see for a dry ewe, it's going to be somewhere around 2% of her body, right? So we're going to take that 150 pound ewe and times it by that 2% get three pounds of forage. So this is how much forage she will need to eat per day to kind of, you know, roughly meet her requirements, her dry matter intake requirements. You know, this might not meet all of her crude protein and um, energy requirements, but that would require further analysis, you know, to um, see if it meets those. If we take those three pounds times our 50 U's, that means you need 150 pounds um, per day, you know, of forage to meet, you know, the dry matter intake for the, all those sheep, right? So once you have that number, then you can calculate the number of grazing days in the pasture. So we're going to take our total forage production allocated in step two, you know, and of pasture and forage demand. Um, and then we're going to take our forage demand, so step three, and figure out the number of days. So we had 25 pounds of forage allocated. So that's how much forage that we said that we could um, feed those animals. Oops. And then divided by, you know, that 150 pounds of forage per day. So this was how much forage we needed for those 50 ewes, right? And that means, so on your five acres, you can graze roughly, you know, 16.7 days on that pasture. Right. So that's continuous grazing. Right. And then you're going to run out of forage uh, production. So after that 16.7 days, you're going to have to figure out some other means of feeding those animals, you know, taking them off the pasture, allowing that pasture to regrow. And that's where, you know, having the grazing stick or like, you know, doing the um, clip and weigh method, you know, if you can kind of monitor it, you know, then you can figure out when you can really put them back on that pasture. So, and I didn't put it in this presentation because it would have been too much. Um, but if you're doing like rotational grazing, um, you potentially can be able to extend that grazing season a little. So then my last kind of little um, step that I always, you know, like to bring in um, calculating forage demand is just keeping records, right? So I'm using a lot of book values for this, um, these calculations, right? Every farm is different, you know, depending on your soil type, depending on where you're, you're at, you know, so it's quite important, like if you want to start somewhere, I mean, I would first, you know, reach out to your extension or NRCS because they probably would know your area pretty well. You know, what you guys are going to have available um, and your weather is going to be a lot different in Missouri than it is in South Dakota here. So, but over time, if you're keeping records on what your pasture growth does, you know, and how much your animals eat, you can kind of fine tune it um, to fit your actual farm and know what your property is capable of. So that is kind of all that I had for today. So I put in here a few um, additional resources. So if you're not a math person, um, our range uh, specialist, she actually put together like a grazing calculator that goes through um, and will calculate all of those different things um, based off of, you know, the type of animal that you have and your, you know, pasture um, measurements, right? And then 
put in here, you know, contact your local forage rain extension specialists. And I should have put in here, NRCS can be a very great resource as well. Um, so with that, do any of you have any questions? Oh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I think there's a question here. Um, can you read that, Dr. Kelly? We can give information on deficiencies in soil for supplementing. Did you see that, Dr. Kelly? Um, like, so if, if your soil is deficient in nutrients, mm -hmm. how do you get how do, how do you get information on the deficiency? We can give information. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, again, this can vary a lot, right? A good place to kind of start. So the USDA, and I was going to put it in here, um, has like a soil website um, that um, I'm trying to remember the exact name, but you can like look up kind of soil maps. Um, and uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember what exactly it's called. If you Google USDA soil website, I think it will pop up, right? That can be a great spot. Um, otherwise, I would recommend, you know, taking soil samples of your farm, right? Um, and I don't know if you guys have a soil like extension specialist, I would assume that you would. Um, but you can take those and there's a lot of universities if they have a soil department, they oftentimes will do you know soil analysis and they can kind of give you recommendations on what um you might be deficient in um they can give you recommendations for fertilizing um but it's also just a good thing to know like you know if you're raising sheep or goats so like um i'm originally from minnesota i still have sheep in minnesota we're very selenium deficient right so we know that and it can cause a lot of issues um during the lambing time. So we, you know, actually add more selenium. Um, we have a custom mineral that we add more selenium into, so. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, we also have soil testing um, available in the extension office. So in case you need any help, please just um, send us an email, we'll be able to help you with that. In addition to that, when I went to visit a farmer just two days ago, and she just told me of how, you know, they had selenium deficiency you know, and they affect a lot of their um, sheep and lamb. And I think that's why the soil test is very important, you know, so please reach out to us and we'll be able to help you. Um, somebody is raising their his or her hand, but I'm going to ask them. Before that, there's a question that says, where can I purchase a grazing steak? Googling, I ran a bit, I don't see an obvious choice. I'm going to ask you to say that before I contribute to that, please. Yeah, Um. so like, our local NRCS office here in South Dakota, actually, they'll like give them out for free. Um, I don't know uh, what Missouri has, but I mean, NRCS would probably be a good starting place. Great. Um, I just um, attended also um, through the intensive grazing school. At, of course, we have that organized by ME Extension. And of course, part of things that they give is on grazing steak and stuff like that. So if you want any information, please reach out to the office or can direct you to where you can get a purchase a grazing stick. Thank you. Um, Ms. Debbie, can this person, can you um, admit the person to ask his question or a question, I'm not sure, uh, if possible? I have my hand raised. Um, yeah, thank you. Go ahead, sir. So the, the, the idea of the take half, leave half idea makes sense to me on a, uh, like a plant by plant basis. But uh, like thinking about it at the level of my pasture, if I have like a bunch of diverse plants in my pasture that have differing um, <clears throat> palate abilities, if I only leave 50% of the, the highly palatable, um, the highly palatable forage, then that means that I'm leaving way more of the unpalatable forage and those plants are get, aren't getting grazed at all so mm -hmm. won't i just be slowly making my stocking density uh or my stocking rate go down year over year if those unpalatable plants themselves are just not getting touched and then they're going to outcompete the highly palatable plants that i want to keep yeah um that's a good question, actually. Um, yeah. So when I say like 
you know, the take half, leave half, you know, that's a very generalized statement, right? Um, so like exactly what you're saying, if you have an unpalatable plant and your animals aren't necessarily um, eating it over the digestible stuff, you know, you might have to increase the grazing pressure or something like that to get them to eat it down. Um, and this is where maybe like if you reach out to your local like forage specialist that they might be able to help you and come up with like the best management strategy um, just to, you know, come up with, you know, how to graze it. Cause maybe they have experience grazing, whatever you're talking about, um, you know, and can kind of come up with that, you know, great grazing um, strategy. But yeah, like in general, that is a very generalized statement, right? You know, if we're grazing goats or sheep and we're target browsing, you know, a certain plant, yeah, that grazing pressure and stuff, it might have to change. But the the whole concept of that, you know, graze half, you know, or take half, leave half, you know, is just so that you're not kind of overgrazing. Can I just um make uh, i guess where what i'm doing is like having to rehab pasture that i that is like really bad that that i own mm -hmm. so um it, it, can i i guess that the question that i'm mainly asking is like is it still over grazing if i graze it down and then i gave it significant rest period like if i'm giving it longer rest period is it still really going to affect like if I'm doubling the rest period instead of coming back to that field, aren't I aren't I not necessarily overgrazing it at a different time scale? I mean, you can look at it that one that way too a little bit. Um, the main thing is like, you know, there's certain plant species like if you overgraze it, you know, those roots are going to die and then they're going to die out and then you get other unwanted plants, right? Um, so, and that's where, cause I don't know what kind, what kind of plants are in your pasture, right? You know, different plant species are going to have, you know, different grazing, um, you know, kind of pressures, if that makes sense. Um, so like, you know, if you can reach out to your local forage person, they might be able to help you on that. Um, but certainly like, okay, if you know you overgrazed a pasture and you're giving it longer rest periods to recover, that's going to help that plant, certainly. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think um, Dr. Kelly mentioned the fact that, you know, we need to be careful because of the larvae, you know, when it comes to worm infestation, which is a very big issue when it, you know, with smurmulant. And as a rule of thumb, we want to live up to about four to five inches, you know, for, for of, of your uh, pasture so that, you know, the animals do not graze down and they will not be able to get infested, infected with the with the larvae of this babapo worm and all these um, um, GI gastrointestinal parasites. So uh, as a rule of thumb, I think we should avoid, avoid grazing down, you know, on the pasture to avoid a lot of complications that might come as, as a result of that. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, we just got an information that um, for grazing steak, we could check with the Missouri Forage and Grassland Council. So please, if you want to check on the website, Missouri Forage and Grassland Council for grazing sticks, they might want to provide information or reach out to any of the extension offices close to you. Um, without much ado, we want to thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, thank you so much for your time. You know, I know what it means to, to take one and a half of your busy schedule. We thank you so much. And, um, just want to make a quick announcement. Um, we're going to be having the new edition you know, of this webinar series on November 28th, 2023, the same time, 12 p.m. And we're going to be having a very interesting topic. Um, the topic is how to evaluate and increase profit margin in sheep and good farming. How do we evaluate and increase our profit margin in sheep and good farming? I know we are in this operation for profit. And so we have a guest speaker, Christina Ballard. She work with smart reproduction in Arkansas. She's ready to give us a lot of information on how to evaluate and increase profit margin. So please, um, if you want to please register, um, the information is available for you to please go ahead and register for that, um, for that webinar section. And finally, we have, um, Ship and Goods Fields Day 2023. It's going to come up on November 17th, 
from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. at Southwest Research Extension and Education Center. So you want information, please reach out to us at the office. And we'll be having forage and pasture management, part of which Dr. Kelly just covered today, integrated parasite management control, uh, being part of low-performing animals and formature system. All these are combined together on that day. Once again, Dr. Kelly, thank you for your time. And we're going to make this slide available. So please reach out to the office extension um, to our office uh, manager, Ms. Debbie. She's going to um, send that um, the presentation of Dr. Kelly today to our that that won that. We'll see you next month. Dr. Kelly, thank you. Well, final word from you, Dr. Kelly, as, as a depart. Final word from you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, bye. Thanks.